This episode of Primitive Culture is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and to help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international programme of the non-profit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode, join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is Tim Russ, Lieutenant Commander Tuvok on Star Trek Voyager, and you're listening to Trek FM. Open your mind to the past. Oh, this may mean something. I've been coerced into watching tonight's movie. You do have books in the 24th century. It's a primitive culture. I'm just trying to blend in. Some people think the future means the end of history. We haven't run out of history quite yet. Hello and welcome to Primitive Culture, a Trek FM podcast all about our history, our culture and how Star Trek relates to it. I'm Duncan Barrett and joining me today is a friend from across the Trek FM network, Brandy Jackler. Hi Brandy, how are you? I am very well, Duncan. How are you? Well, I'm not feeling too great, to be honest. I, uh, I'm i feeling a bit kind of short of breath, uh, my heart rate's starting to race, feeling a bit kind of clammy. Uh, I've just got this sort of feeling of dread. I'm not quite sure... Why? Something about uh, podcasting today is, is is really kind of taking it out of me. Oh, I am so sorry to hear that. I'm not having that problem at all. But if you uh, were to show me a picture of a clown, I would probably start to have the same reaction. Uh, well, maybe that's it. Because just before we started to record, I, di- I did go and watch the uh, Voyager episode, The Thor, uh, in preparation for this discussion. So who knows, maybe, you know, deep into my unconscious that has kind of buried its way in. Um, but the the reason we're, we're talking about this uh, subject today, funnily enough, actually, you're talking about clowns since we've got the, the new It film just coming out in the cinemas, um, is we are looking at uh, fear and maybe to be more precise, I suppose, phobias. Uh, which I guess is, is slightly more specific than the kind of more general topic uh, of fear and how Star Trek has kind of um, approached phobias uh, generally. The funny thing is, I can actually, this is, goes to show the kind of psychological effect of these things. I can, simply by talking about those things, I do start to feel slightly anxious about them. I feel more anxious now than I did a minute ago when we started talking. <laughs> so there you go. That's a testament to the power of the mind. I'm not sure if I'm quite going to get to the point where I give myself a heart attack and die in the middle of this podcast, as happened in that Voyager episode. But, you know, who knows? Uh, our, our, our minds and our bodies are clearly very closely intertwined uh, when it comes to these kind of um, really primal emotions like fear. And, and Star Trek certainly is is interested in that in various ways. It is. It's something that I don't think will ever go away, no matter how evolved humanity gets, because there's just so much we still don't know about our own brains and how they work. So uh, I know that it's a psychological issue, but I don't really find that to mean I'm crazy because people hear mental illness or psychological issues and they're like, oh, well, you're crazy. no. It's an illness, just like a physical illness. It's just treated differently, and you can't necessarily see the symptoms. So, yeah. Unless you're Barclay, in which case everyone just just thinks you're crazy generally, because <laughs> yeah. it's kind of a different problem in every episode. But but yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think you're right. The interesting thing about phobias, I suppose, is that there is usually, um, I would say, maybe this is not true. I was going to say there's usually a cause. Possibly it depends on the kind of phobia. Certainly the kind of phobias I've experienced in my life, uh, for example, I have a phobia of flying. Uh, I can do it now. There was a long period of time where I really couldn't do it at all. I can do it now, but it requires a lot of kind of mental preparation and work. And that is a phobia that I could trace back to a very specific experience. Um, I was on a plane coming home from visiting relatives in Dublin. Uh, I was with my grandmother at the time who was just... Uh, beginning to suffer from kind of early onset of Alzheimer's. So her kind of, um, her thoughts were a little bit jumbled and, and her, let's say her sense of sort of appropriate conversation wasn't always totally, um, 
in place as it would have been. We were on this rather small plane coming back through a storm. The plane got struck by lightning. There was a massive noise, a loud kind of bang. All the lights in the plane went off. And my grandmother uh, very calmly turned to me and said, oh, I think we're all going to die now. And I don't know in retrospect, looking back on this event, whether it was actually the fact of the, of the lightning strike, which... You know, I've, I've, I've read up about this understandably afterwards and discovered that planes quite often get struck by lightning. It's not particularly dangerous. And it's not a big deal. And needless to say, the cabin crew were not panicking and preparing for an emergency landing or anything. They knew that it was not particularly dangerous. But I think for me, the combination of this quite scary thing happening and then my grandma making this totally inappropriate remark uh, really did something in my you know, conscious and down into my sort of unconscious brain. And for years, I would just avoid uh, altogether um, taking flights. And then in the end, I sort of got to a point where I thought this is really uh, limiting my my life and I'm going to have to deal with it. And I did take various steps um, kind of to deal with that one. Uh, so, so it's interesting for me looking at something like Realm of Fear, the next gen episode, um, about Barclay and his fear of the transporter, which I think is very much a kind of allegory for a fear of flying and written by Brandon Braga, who himself has a fear of flying, I understand. And I think that's where a lot of that came from. Um, and is maybe why you see him writing with a couple of transporter phobic characters to you also get Hoshi, of course, in Enterprise. And then famously Zephram Cochran, who is actually uh, afraid of flying in planes, <laughs> just like me <laughs> and just like Brandon. So, you know, there you go. It's no obstacle to a great career in, uh, aviation one way or another. <laughs> That's true. You know, I just looking at my own phobias, I can trace most of them back to a single defining incident, but not all of them. There's one that I have that I'm really not sure how or why it started, but it's always been there. Just always. And so I'm wondering if something happened to me when I was so young that I don't remember it. I have no way to know for sure. Do you genuinely have a fear of clowns? I do. I do generally have a fear of clowns. And when I was in sixth grade in school, back when they used to let kids dress up for Halloween and do a parade around the school for all the other classes, which was a great day. We loved Halloween back then. Now it's just all political correctness and, oh, no, we can't have kids wear anything. Um I wanted to, my mother asked me wanted what I wanted to be, and I said I wanted to be a clown because that was the scariest thing that I could think of to be. And so she made me a clown outfit. And so for a day, I was the thing that scared me. And it was the most bizarre Halloween ever. Ranks up there with the time my sister was Darth Vader. So... <laughs> And which which is more scary? That's the question, really, isn't it? You know, the, I've never quite understood the thing about clowns. But then actually, I never saw I still have never seen it, the original film. And I think I don't know why I never watched it, uh, because I've never felt particularly scared of clowns. But maybe that's why I didn't watch it, because I didn't want to be scared of clowns. I mean, maybe that film just kind of traumatised a generation of kids. Yeah, but that came after. You were definitely scared before that. Yes. Well, there goes that theory then. Yeah, unfortunately, I was scared of clowns before it because it came along when I was a teenager. I was 11 when I was a clown for Halloween. Actually, I, I wasn't 11 yet. I wasn't 11 yet. I was 10. I skipped a grade. And so because of the school year and it goes from like September to June and I my birthday's in May. But anyway, um yeah, that's that's not where it started. I think that w it's because when I was a kid, there were still circuses about, and I had been to a few of them. And from a distance, clowns were funny and, you know, jokey. And up close, they were terrifying. I think it's because I just kind of felt this sadness coming from some of them. And so... And I didn't know how to interpret that as a child. And so I, it turned into a fear. Well, it, I suppose it is possible that the fear of clowns comes from like early exposure of kids to circuses when they're too young to deal with the kind of emotional chaos of the circus environment, which I suppose is sort of what that Voyager episode, The Thor, is going for. I have to say, as much as there are elements of that episode that I think are great, like particularly the last sort of 20 seconds, the, the the circus environment in that episode, it, I have never found particularly scary. Do you know what I mean? It has this, it feels very sort of original series somehow. It's very kind of brightly coloured and kind of um, uh, OTT, but not in a sort of freaky way. 
I, d- I don't think it really captures it. Whereas it, not that I've seen it, not that I've seen the remake, not that I've seen the sequel that's out right now. Uh, I just get the impression from like the clips that I've seen and so on that, that it sort of taps into to something about that fear um, that, that that is genuinely slightly creepy. And also, I suppose part of it is that it's kind of uncanny. Um, and I don't know about you. I mean, in the TNG episode, we also have O'Brien with his fear of spiders and he, he doesn't quite become a spider, uh, as, as you became the clown, but obviously he decides to keep a pet spider as a way of kind of, I suppose, proving that he's conquered that fear and, and, and maybe sort of topping up his like ability to cope with that. I have similarly, uh, I'm not scared of spiders, but I am scared of snakes. Now, weirdly, I'm less scared of snakes in reality. Like I have encountered snakes in real life and I would, back off from them a bit I, like I wouldn't go particularly near to them but they don't completely freak me out it's in dreams in sort of actually what what to be honest like watching a snake on tv would freak me out more in a weird way than seeing one in person I don't know what that's about uh I, I don't know really what that is unfortunately my son who's four is obsessed with snakes and what he wants to do all the time is watch videos of snakes he has some snake called um Medusa that he he keeps saying play Medusa play Medusa and this is some clip on YouTube of some woman with an enormous snake that she gets out and shows to the cameras <laughs> and so my my real terror to be honest is that he's going to grow up and become like a snake obsessive and have a house with 20 snakes in it and I just don't know what I'm going to do but I think again that the fear of snakes is partly a kind of there's something uncanny there's something weird about them you know they've they, they don't have enough legs the spiders have got too many legs it's like this kind of quite primal sense of um something about this creature is kind of wrong somehow. Uh, and I feel slightly guilty about that because I sort of feel, well, the snake hasn't done anything to me, really, uh, for me to have all this prejudice against it. But, you know, there you go. Yeah, I I was scared of snakes until the third grade when a person from our local zoo had brought a bunch of animals from the reptile house. And one of the things that she brought was a snake. And she brought it around to each student to let us touch the snake because none of us had ever touched a snake. You know, we were kids. We were like seven, eight years old. And when I touched that snake, I'm like, oh, oh, this is fine. It doesn't feel slimy like I thought it was. It actually feels a little bit dry and just kind of scaly and pleasant. And from that time, I've never been afraid of snakes. However, when I do go into a reptile house of any kind and go to the area where there are snakes, they always start crawling up the window to look at me. I don't know why that is. (laughs) My husband has witnessed it. You've read Harry Potter, right? No, yes. This was before Harry Potter, guys, because I have been to these places with my husband and he just watches he would watch astonished as all the snakes would just come out of their spot and they just stop start going up against the glass to get on my eye level and i'm like hey what's up yo (laughs) i don't know maybe they see me as an ally maybe maybe i'm one of those reptile aliens from v i don't know (laughs) i don't know what it is but snakes seem to like me for some reason (laughs) So what I should have asked you before, Brandy, uh, I mean, before we go on and, and talk a bit more detail about the, the Star Trek episodes that we're, that we're looking at, what what is the phobia that you can't explain? You were saying there was a, there was a phobia from your childhood that you have no no explanation for. What's that one? A fear of heights, not necessarily being high up, but falling from them. Like I'm fine in a plane. I'm absolutely fine in a plane. If I'm like in a a very tall building or something like that, I'm fine if I'm in an enclosed space. But if there is open air, I am terrified. I do not know why that is. I don't know how that started. I wonder if that may be quite a natural one, though. In some ways, I remember reading somewhere that there are only two Pho- well, I don't know if you call them phobias, but there are two things that freak out babies and they are loud noises and falling from a height. And I don't know if the fear of heights is obviously like associated with the idea of a fear of falling, because I guess if you're a baby, uh, those are the bad, like being dropped, it would be pretty bad. And a loud noise could be, you know, something terrible is kind of about to happen. So you may you're have just like solved. I may have solved that. <laughs> you may have. OK, this is going to sound crazy because I was so young that I couldn't possibly remember this physically. Well, with my brain, but my body may have remembered it. When I was three weeks old, my mother was uh, walking across the yard. She had just, my, my dad had just parked and she, he, 
stopped. She was getting out of the car with me. She had me in a basket. And my dad had been putting new sprinklers in the lawn and had dug holes for the places he was going to put these sprinklers. And she didn't see one of the holes and she put her foot in it and fell forward. And as she fell, I fell. And when she hit the ground, I rolled out of the basket and she thought I was dead. Because I wasn't moving, wasn't making a sound. And so she, you know, she scrambles over to me and she touches me and I start screaming my head off. This is how my mother tells it. And uh, she knew something was wrong. My dad was like, no, she's fine. She's fine. She's just, you know, upset. My mother said, no, something is wrong. And they took me to the emergency room and my left femur was broken. And so I was in traction for six weeks in the hospital I, there are pictures of this and the look on my face is very, what is this? Why? Uh, because, you know, I'm a baby. I don't understand. But that actually could explain a couple of the things. <laughs> that is, wow. You also have a phobia of hospitals? <laughs> uh, no, I don't have a phobia of hospitals, but, um, I do, I do have claustrophobia. And I think that that has two causes. I think one being immobilized in traction was one of them. And the other is my sisters holding me down and tickling me until I couldn't breathe. And I think that those are bo- those combined to make me claustrophobic. Because not, not being able to move and not being able to breathe are two of the most frightening things ever. And I will panic. I will go into fight or flight. My husband has seen it. <laughs> wow! Solved the mystery. Oh my god, I had no <laughs> idea. Councillor Troy here. You know that's that's my job done for this evening. <laughs> Thank you, Duncan. I appreciate that. Wow. The question really is whether whether uh, working out these kind of things makes any difference at all in um, in curing them or not. And I suppose that's an interesting question. I mean, with with my flying phobia, the treatment that I uh, undertook for it, I kind of went overboard. I tried lots of different things. One of which I should say, which may be the thing that is the most effective, is uh, getting some Valium from the doctor and taking that before I get on the plane, which yes. I still do. I, I have I have done one or two flights without it when I was feeling particularly confident, like I didn't need it. But generally, I take it anyway, just because it sort of takes the the anxiety away from it all. But the the other things I did was I I read a book uh, by a man called Alan Carr, who was very famous. Um, I don't know if, he, if if this would be the case in the states, but he's, he's very famous for um, helping people quit smoking. He, did, he wrote this book about like how to quit smoking, uh, and everyone said they yeah, would read this book, and by the time they got to the last page, they'd never touch a cigarette again. And anyway, then he tried to do another one for fear of flying, and that was very helpful because it kind of explains a lot about what's actually going on and the kind of anxieties that you have, like the noises that the aircraft is making. It sort of explains what they might be. Uh, it, one thing I found very helpful, because I realised even before I was afraid of flying, I was quite superstitious about flying. I always used to, when the plane was about to take off, I'd, I'd have all these sort of weird rituals I'd sort of got into. Like if I'd always be reading a book and I'd feel I had to get to the end of a certain paragraph by the time the wheels lifted <laughs> off, otherwise the plane wouldn't fly. So I'm like, you know, all these, I mean, I wasn't consciously thinking of it like that, but I would get into these kind of weird habits um and one of the things he said that i found really helpful was actually it's not hard for a plane to take off that effectively anything going that fast uh is that, that actually what the plane is doing is trying not to take off too early and really you, you know pl- something with wings going at that kind of speed its natural inclination is to take off just like a hat gets blown around in the wind or whatever um, and what the plane is doing is preventing itself from taking off until it's ready and then it takes off at the right time so things like that i found um quite helpful and then the other thing was that these uh paul mckenna tapes which is like sort of hypnosis and all that sort of thing um and, and some of the techniques actually that paul mckenna uses are quite similar to the techniques that diana troy uses in Realm of Fear, the plexing technique, which kind of looks like a load of nonsense. And I think it probably is. He has a a similar technique where you tap different parts of your head and, and, and do all this stuff. Now, I'm fairly convinced that all it does is distract you from what you're thinking. But anyway, there's some theory that it's working into different parts of the brain and the body and, and all this sort of thing. But then also he does this thing where you you do have to identify the the cause of the phobia. So in my case, that plane that was struck by lightning and my grandma's saying oh we're all going to die now uh, and then you play it back in your mind and you kind of shrink the image so you reduce the sort of um emotional weight of it you play it really quickly in your mind and he plays on the tape this sort of silly jokey like kind of benny hill music to kind of trivialize it and make it ridiculous <laughs> so there is this kind of sense of like finding the traumatic memory and then consciously replaying it but replaying it with a different kind of emotion associated with it um 
And it does help, I would say, just insofar as I, I don't know whether that's the thing that allowed me to like get on a plane, you know, how many weeks later. But while you're doing it, you can feel that it is slightly changing how you're feeling about the thing that you're remembering, if you know what I mean. So maybe maybe it is actually really important to identify the kind of the cause. And I suppose that is um, an interesting question from the Star Trek point of view, because, you know, you mentioned uh, claustrophobia. We have, of course, Garrick in Deep Space Nine who suffers from claustrophobia. And I think those episodes are quite interesting insofar as they kind of, they, they sort of toy with there being a cause, but then knowing that it's Garrick and you never know whether anything he says is true or not, we're, we're sort of left slightly uncertain about, you know, what exactly has, has caused it. And, and the revelation at the end of that episode after image is not, is not so much about a past trauma. It's this very kind of psychoanalytic theory that the claustrophobia is acting out some sort of unconscious uh, anxiety or unconscious desire on his part. Um, which I think is interesting and it sort of works dramatically, but I don't know whether that is actually how phobias work necessarily, certainly not the ones that I've experienced personally. Yeah, I don't know. I think that, I don't think that there is one pat solution or formula for how phobias work. I think it depends a lot on the individual and their personal experiences. And so trying to take this one theory and make it a one size fits all, I think is rather foolish because it does have a lot to do with personal experience. And it's, you know, it's not going to just be a one solution thing either. Because what works for somebody is not going to work for another person, just like any other kind of psychological treatment and just like any medication, really. Not all medications work for all people. Some people don't do well with certain things and some people it has no effect at all. And some people it worked like a charm. It's the same thing with psychological treatments. Absolutely. And I suppose... It's kind of interesting seeing Garrick in those episodes, I think, because we do tend to think of Garrick as someone who is very uh, sort of hyper on top of everything. Do you know what I mean? It's quite interesting to see him in those situations where he's struggling to function, sort of struggling to cope. Um, and I suppose with all these stories, I mean, Barclay is almost a kind of easy case because Barclay's like the, the neurotic on the ship. Like if anything is going wrong, it's going to be going wrong with Barclay in a sense. So mm. it's kind of like you expect him to have that. But I do sort of wonder when you see these characters and and you could say the same with enterprise with hoshi uh obviously she grows a lot during the course of that series but early on there are episodes kind of emphasizing hoshi's a bit ambivalent about being in space she's a bit sort of scared generally uh even with esri dax in that episode with garrick she's sort of saying she's suffering space sickness she's not kind of totally all there i do sort of wonder if there's this question do we um is it safer for these stories to focus on someone like garrick or um, someone like Barclay than for it to be Picard, who has a, a, a debilitating phobia, or Riker, or one of these characters who we kind of expect almost to be perfect. Um, and does that kind of, you know, would it be better in some ways if Star Trek was showing quite, uh, that th those kind of more idealised characters is also having to deal with these things? We do see Beverly in the episode Attached admitting to a fear of heights, uh, which, you know, Picard seems quite surprised by, but then is... is fairly supportive about. Yeah, I, this is my personal feeling. I honestly never liked the way that they treated Barkley on Next Generation. I felt that uh, they were unfair to him a lot of the time. And there are a lot of aspects of Barkley that I strongly identify with. And so whenever they were attacking him, I felt attacked. So I, I actually had a lot of sympathy for his phobias. And same thing with Garrick. Because honestly, Garrick is like my second favorite character in all of Deep Space Nine. <laughs> he used to be first until I rewatched the series. And then he, he moved a little bit down to second, but it's r really right at the top. And I appreciated seeing people who were normally known as strong to have a phobia, to have some kind of thing that made them more relatable. I would like to see that in other characters. I would like to see that in these so-called perfect characters, because again, it is something relatable. It is something that we poor peons can actually identify with instead of, you know, holding these people basically up to the level of gods. Mm. Well, I do wonder whether partly it's that there is an element of stigma around phobias, just as there is around, you know, other more sort of serious mental health issues. I mean, I feel uh, I, I sort of try to, uh, 
talk to people openly about like my, my fear of planes or whatever. But for years, I mean, I suppose when I, when I d- wasn't doing anything about it, I tried my best to keep it a secret. So I would just say, oh, no, I, I just much like Zephyr and Cochrane. I much prefer taking the train, you know. <laughs> I'd much rather uh, go, with, go the, the long way around, basically, you know. Or, oh, oh, no, it's much better for the environment to get a boat or, you, you know, whatever it is. I mean, literally at one point I was considering whether it would be worth to take a trip from London to New York. You know, what would it be, you know, how expensive would it be and what would it be like to go on a boat rather than a plane, which, you know, I looked into and it was just unjustifiable. You know, it was it was yeah. ludicrous, the idea of doing that. But I mean, I think there is a kind of real uh, sort of stigma there. One thing that's quite interesting is in that uh, episode with Garrick, which I think is, it must be by Inferno's light when he's he's, he's having his kind of claustrophobic uh, attacks in the uh, Dominion prison. They sort of have this quite, um, I think it's well-intentioned, but the way it's shot and the way it's sort of directed and staged uh, it just seems very cheesy and kind of it's got that sort of after school special feel you've got the two Klingons Worf and Martok basically having this moment saying how how brave and honourable they think Garrick is for facing his fear one of them says um, uh, he says there is Martok says there's no greater enemy than one's own fears and Worf says it takes a brave man to face them <laughs> it's almost like this sort of little moment I mean it's it's nice that they're doing that but at the same time it feels so um I don't know, so sort of obvious as a uh, as a gesture mm. uh, to sort of say, uh, you, you know, yes, OK, this character seems to be completely unable to cope, but we're going to try and say something nice about them. Um, and the fact is, I mean, Garrick does uh, do extremely well, given how what an absolute state he's in. He's talking to himself. He's, you know, he's, he's really not having a good time. Uh, he manages to get through it. And the same with Barclay, actually. I mean, Barkley, I think in Realm of Fear, I think one of the things they get really well is in that scene. I think it's even before the teaser where he first steps onto the transporter pad and he's kind of sweating. He's, he's feeling anxious. I mean, as someone who, you know, does suffer from a fear of flying, all of those symptoms are symptoms that I recognize. Do you know what I mean? It's exactly, you, you get a real strong sense of what it feels like. And I, I do think it helped with that episode that you had Brandon Braga writing it as someone who actually has personally experienced something very similar and then just kind of translating it across. And I think you also get w- one of the lines that I quite like in that episode, uh, which is a bit like that interaction between the Klingons in some ways, but I feel this sort of plays slightly more for laughs, is Geordie has this kind of line about, you know, he, he keeps going on about how safe it is and the safety record of transporters. And he even has this line, transporting really is the safest way to travel. And again, it sort of sounds a bit like a, a kind of um, an advert or something. It sounds so sort of pat and trivial. Uh, and it's just that sense of when you're scared of something like that, that's what everyone says to you. And you know that it's true. You, you, you know, you know, rationally speaking, that far more people die in cars than on planes and, and so on. But it doesn't make any difference whatsoever. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Having these sort of people like Geordie, uh, you know, making these kind of remarks, you just sort of feel like, yeah, you don't get it at all, you know. So, um, but I quite liked that they put that in the episode. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Statistically, it may be safe. However, if you're in a transporter accident or a plane crash, the odds of surviving are pretty much nil. So, though statistically it's safer, if your plane goes down, you're pretty much going to die. Thanks for that. <laughs> that. That's one of those realities I tend to try and uh, talk myself out of just as just as a kind of backup. But I mean, it's interesting because one of the things that the, the stuff on like how to get over a flying phobia uh, would suggest is, 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 I remember in that book that I mentioned, one of the things people were saying, you know, is it better to sit near the back or the front? Is it better to sit near the wing, near the door? You know, where are you more likely to survive? And the guy basically said, it makes no difference. You're not going to die in a plane crash. It doesn't matter. You can sit anywhere you like. Basically, if, you know, don't go down that line of thinking because that line of thinking is really, I suppose, because part of what these things are about is control. And I think the same is true whether you're on a plane, you have no control over the movement of the plane. If you're being transported, it's Chief O'Brien at the controls. You have no control over what's going to happen to you. Um, and in a way, maybe saying, well, if I sit here, then I'm going to be slightly safer is sort of trying to um, claw back a little bit of control of the situation. But actually, in an odd way, it just makes it worse because it sort of emphasizes that there's that there's a need for control. And there's a problem with not being in control. And really, what you have to do is um, just sort of accept that the person who's doing it, if you're going to be transported, Chief O'Brien is the best transporter operator in the entire Federation, probably, you know, and he knows what he's doing a hell of a lot better than you do. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> poor 
Bar Chief. He's probably the best. <laughs> well, as far as we know, the best in Transporter Room 3 anyway. I don't know who they've got in, you know, 1 and 2. <laughs> but, um, you know, no, I, you're I, in safe hands, basically. Yeah. And the, that's the thing. That's the thing about flying, too. Now, there is a difference between an emergency landing and a crash. So because uh, emergency landings are generally survivable. But, you know, if your plane goes down and you have no control over the plane, I mean, like, like terrorists crashed your plane into the World Trade Center. Yeah, you're all going to die because just the <laughs> that that's just the way that it is. And I'm OK with that. I worked for an airline for four years and they yeah. And I learned in some training in the early days that if something is going to go wrong during a flight, it is most likely going to be during takeoff or landing. So, ha- fun fact for you guys: those are the, takeoff is like my favorite part. I love takeoff so much, and uh, there, there was we we just saw they showed us a video about you know what to do if a disaster did happen, and people were calling us because I worked in a reservation center, and if people are calling us asking for information and what the procedure was for that, that was the whole point of that. So, and it still didn't make me afraid to fly. I'm my father's daughter in that respect. I love to fly. Well, uh, wh- why? What did what does your father do? Uh, my father is sadly no longer with us, but he, he, when he was in the army, he wanted to be a pilot. But back then, they had stigmas about people who required glasses or corrective lenses of any kind, and would never let him do that. But he always had a lifelong fascination with planes, and so, and we have an air force base that is not far from us, and. Uh, there are air shows there every summer. So and we're close enough where I live now that we could just go outside in our backyard and watch the Blue Angels flying. And so I just, I, I grew up watching my dad love these things. And by watching him, I grew to love those things as well. So love airplanes, love ships, and Star Trek, and uh, watches. <laughs> I inherited my dad's obsession with watches. Love watches. Fair enough. Well, I love ships. I love ships, I suppose, because I know that I can swim. And you, you know, in the worst case scenario, that'll keep me going for a little while. So I don't feel, whereas I can't fly. That's the thing. If I could fly, I'd be totally happy on the airplane, you, you know, knowing sure. that I could just jump out a window or whatever. But it's, right. it's the fact that you're up there and you know that you don't know how to fly. Uh, and also, I think that kind of awareness that like, on some basic level, I think the same thing, almost the same thing with the snakes. They're like, there's something wrong with this. It doesn't have enough legs. There's something wrong with this metal thing. It shouldn't be. Do you know what I mean? It's not a bird. It's not a bat. It's, it's, it doesn't look like the other things that fly around. You, you know, there is kind of, um, I don't know, a, a sort of an element of that to it as well. Um, but it's based on the same concept of how birds fly. Because birds create lift with their wings, and they're not always flapping their wings. When they get to a certain altitude, their wings aren't really flapping. They're just maneuvering them to create downward or upward or sideways motions, the same way a plane would with its flaps. That is quite true. And of course, in Voyager, we saw uh, Leonardo and Janeway between them uh, <laughs> developing a similar yes, theory. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. I suppose the other thing that's interesting, though, that we don't, I don't think we see all that much of in Star Trek, though maybe we do a little bit with Hoshi at the beginning of Enterprise, is um, my partner sometimes asks me, you know, because she knows I love Star Trek and I love sci-fi and space stuff, and she knows that I'm scared of flying. She sort of says, you know, well, would you... If you had the opportunity to go into space, would you do it? And I don't know, I don't know what the answer is because I would be absolutely terrified to go into space because I think as much as you can say commercial aircraft are statistically very safe, spacecraft are much less safe. <laughs> you know, there is actually a much greater chance of something going wrong. On the other hand, it does seem like a shame if someone was offering you an experience like that, it would be a shame kind of not to take it. But I wonder, we don't see too much of that in the Star Trek universe. I guess maybe it's a little bit like uh, spacecraft to them are almost like trains are to us. And most people these days are not scared of trains. When trains were new, maybe more people were worried about them. Maybe there were more accidents. Uh, And despite the fact that there are train accidents, I don't think most people, unless they've been in one, develop a phobia of trains. Certainly I've never met anyone who... I, I don't worry when I get on a train, oh, this train might crash and we might all die, even though I have seen footage of 
train accidents. Yeah, it just doesn't, for some reason, it doesn't cross my mind, whereas it does very much um, on a plane. I guess in Star Trek, what you get is the transporter and you get these, you know, over and over again. I mean, not just Barclay, but you have Pulaski, you have McCoy, you've got Hoshi, as I say. Uh, there's sort of this idea that certain, typically, I, I suppose... I don't know, Pulaski and McCoy are quite similar and they're these kind of crusty traditionalists and there's this kind of sense of like, oh, we don't like this newfangled technology. Mm. A bit like those people who used to think when they started building trains, oh, if a human body accelerates beyond 50 miles an hour, it will explode or something. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's almost <laughs> something uh, deeply creepy about it. But then, of course, Star Trek uh, doesn't exactly live by its own principles because as much as they claim that transporters are so safe, well, first of all, if you've seen the motion picture, that would put anyone off going in the transporter because that scene is, is truly horrific but also um the transporter accident might be survivable but you typically you seem to end up with some kind of existential crisis uh you, you know split personality a merged personality uh the number of times that something goes wrong with that transporter is actually you, you end up in a, a parallel universe i mean mm. you know i think there are quite legitimate reasons for having reservations about using those things <laughs> Yes, let's say this thing is so safe and then let's show a lot of accidents. Like how the, the holodeck is always malfunctioning. Why does anyone use the holodeck? Its record is not very good. <laughs> There's always something taking it over or something malfunctioning. Oh, the safeties are off. Oh, no. Yeah, anyway. Oh, we accidentally created a sentient program. Oops. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's uh, those are those funny things about these things. Oh, they're so great. Yeah, but you keep showing us how they're not so great. <laughs> so, yeah, but yeah, transporter. I probably am on the side of those people who would be afraid of it at first. Once it had been tested extensively, I would give it a go. And I would be grateful for that technology right now because my commute to work is just getting longer and longer and longer. So... But yes, I would I would expect at least a hundred years of testing before I wanted to get on that platform. <laughs> you don't want to be Silas Silas Ramsey or whatever his name is. No, no, I don't. Yeah, I really no. don't. It was your molecule scattered. But I mean I suppose the other advantage of the transport here is at least it's quick. So, you know, you don't have to sit there, you know, with your hands gripping the, the armrests on the plane for 10 hours or whatever. At least, you know, it's over with, uh, in a few seconds, one way or another, which I think kind of, um, makes it a bit more, more manageable somehow. Um, there are. Um, I don't no. know. For Hoshi, it was not quick at all. Well, that is true. That is true. That she, is... she lived. She, <laughs> she had like a kind of inner light days. moment in that in that beam. She did, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a very strange episode, I think. I mean, uh, as, as sort of aside from the the phobia, and the interesting thing is there, it, it does sort of tie into this idea that the fear of the transporter is almost a kind of existential fear, mm. because her fear is not actually the fact that she's going to die, although that is an element of it, and they keep looking for like some bit of goo that might once have been Hoshi and so on. <laughs> Yes. element but it's it's this sense of the the terror of her disappearing do you know what i mean of her kind of becoming invisible i mean it's called vanishing point that episode yes. um it's very much like there was an episode of buffy i think where there was a, a girl at the school who who no one paid much attention to and she gradually sort of became invisible essentially so it's interesting there that that hoshi's fear is not so much um it's not the the kind of what happens in the motion picture that she gets put together wrong and, and dies some hideous, gruesome death. It's that somehow she's literally going to start to sort of fade away, that there's something kind of unreal about it. And I suppose Star Trek does have this question, this kind of metaphysical question of what happens when you transport someone. Um, and lots of people have uh, have argued that basically the transporter, what it effectively does is it kills the person and then it recreates a copy of them somewhere else. Because if you look at the the the, the way that it's described in like the technical manuals and so on, um, some people would argue, you know, if you believe in a soul or if you believe in any of these kind of things, that whatever that thing is can't possibly actually sort of be moved in that way it's literally it's dismantling something in one place and, and reconstructing it somewhere else so i suppose there is always that kind of metaphysical question of once you've been transported the first time are you actually the same person you were before and i suppose no one can answer that exactly from within that process in some ways because it, it seems like there's always a kind of disjunct it, it, all we can say is that ev to everyone else that person seems exactly the same they have all those memories intact 
Uh, but who knows? Maybe it is effectively the same situation as dying and then seconds later being, you know, like a, a clone or something that's, that's brought into existence suddenly with all those memories and you would never know the difference. So sort of metaphysically, no one would ever know really, uh, whether they had survived that experience or not. Is Star Trek, you know, is the Federation and the, and Starfleet basically just crewed by, you know, tens of thousands of sort of reanimated zombies effectively that have, <laughs> <laughs> have been reconstructed by the transporters uh, and, and none of them are really the, the person that they were when they signed up. Well, the way that I look at it is this, and this is actually coming at it from a kind of scientific perspective. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed. So really what's happening is it's a transformation from one place to another. They're not killing that person because that person will exist in some form or another due to the energy of life. So, in my opinion, no, it's not a death and reconstitution. It's just a transformation into a substance that can be transported quickly and then reconstituted into your normal form. I don't think it's, you know, a copy or anything like that. But anyone can debate on that and we'll never come to a conclusion because the fact is it doesn't actually exist yet. But the terrifying thing is that a kind of metaphysical question is not in any way answered by whether the, the technology, you know, in the Star Trek universe, the technology clearly works, but the fact that there is no way of answering that question <laughs> does sort of present a real problem. And you do wonder, are there people going around, you know, aside from these kind of transporter phobics who, who are scared in some way of something happening to them, are there people going around with a kind of philosophical objection to the transporter and saying, well, no, my, my religion forbids me to transport or my beliefs about the, the, you know, essence of the, the human soul forbids me to transport or, you know, are there, I'm trying to think in Star Trek, if we ever see cultures that, um, you know, alien cultures that view the transporter as kind of, uh, wrong in some ways, you, you know, you, you could sort of make that argument almost. There is something, uh, slightly, alarming about it something slightly strange about it it's generally viewed as wonderful and I, and I agree you know it would i mean frankly i would much rather transport from london to new york uh than have to take a plane <laughs> so <laughs> you know as far as i'm concerned it would be it would be an enormous convenience uh, yes. and it would definitely be be a great invention but it does sort of raise these weird questions and and maybe as I said, you know, when they first brought in trains, people had all these weird objections to trains and we sort of got over them because we saw they were ridiculous and they didn't make any sense. But, you know, um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's all it takes. Maybe you just have to become familiar with a new technology in order to stop having all these kind of uh, distorted, ira you know, possibly irrational or, or certainly unhelpful ideas about it. I don't know. That's true. That's true. It's uh it's a question we are not going to be able to answer today because brighter minds than ours have <laughs> have made these queries. Somebody get on that story though and write that script about a culture that refuses to transport due to religical religical? Wow, that's not a word. Religious or philosophical uh beliefs. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I was trying to that say religious to and philosophical at the same time and it came out religious. So, <laughs> there you go. There you go, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there are other examples of phobias that I suppose we see um, in Star Trek. I mean, we we hear about Malcolm Reed's aquaphobia in Enterprise, for example. Um, which I don't know if this is really unsympathetic of me. I have to. I have gone on record before saying Reed is probably my least favourite character in the whole of Star Trek. But I always found that faintly ridiculous, and I don't know why. But I've, I I just found it hard to imagine that you could be scared of water but happy to go into space but i guess you, you know maybe that's just me maybe we're we're kind of supposed to buy that um we see neelix suffering from uh, a fear of nothingness in the voyager episode night um and that again i suppose is that would sort of fit in with this idea of it always being these kind of outsider characters it's not the kind of starfleet um crew members who suffer from it and interestingly you know reed's aquaphobia is related in a sort of anecdote rather than it's not that he's put in a situation where he's totally unable to cope because of it. Um, Nog, I guess, suffers from agoraphobia. We could say when he's uh, staying in Vix, when he's recovering from his um, 
uh, I mean, he's also kind of suffering from PTSD, I suppose. But, you, you know, part of that is effectively agoraphobia, that he won't leave the holosuite. He's found a safe environment and he won't kind of go out in the world. Again, you know, OK, Nog is in Starfleet by that point. But again, he's slightly a kind of outsider character. He's not one of the kind of hero characters. Uh, he's a sort of recurring character. And it struck me, it's kind of interesting, I think, in that episode, The Thor, that Janeway, who provides that very iconic and very powerful ending to that episode, one of the things she says to the clown is Starfleet captains don't very often succumb to fear. And that did make me think, is that, do we really buy that? Is that really true? Because I feel like traditionally we might expect that the heroes in a TV show, even in Star Trek or whatever, to say, yes, I was scared, but I, I did it any, you know, sort of feel the fear and do it anyway, you know, to accept that certain situations are scary. But she actually comes right out and says, yeah, we don't get scared. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, and it just sort of made me think, why is that? Why? Um, and is that just the captains? Is that something that, that comes into like the command training? Uh, cause, you know, I'm pretty sure Harry Kim's getting scared in that episode, but it is true. Janeway in that episode is completely cool, completely kind of, um, above it all. Um, and it's interesting because that gives her a lot of strength in the episode, but then it does sort of make you wonder, is that really true? And is that really what we, want from our heroes or do we want them to be a little bit more flawed and a bit more kind of fallible and a bit more human i personally took it a different way i took it as saying yes we experience fear but we don't give in to it so i never took it as her saying that she was never afraid she just knows how to handle her fear and that actually is the definition of courage or bravery is doing something even though you're afraid to do it facing something even though you're afraid to do it because it's just as easy to turn and run the other way uh, for most people. And most people generally should turn and run the other way in certain circumstances. Uh, but I feel like for Starfleet captains, because you cannot tell me that Pike in that episode of Discovery where he saw his future, you can't tell me he wasn't afraid of that. He absolutely was. But he made a choice. He reminded himself who he was, and he didn't succumb to that fear. So that's how I took it, is not that they don't experience fear. It's just that they don't let it rule them. And that they make the right decision, that they do the thing that they're scared of, rather yes, than, exactly. whereas I suppose what Nog is doing in, in that episode, um, It's Only a Paper Moon, is, is avoiding the thing that he's scared of. And and that is the thing actually about phobias is that the more you avoid the thing you're scared of, the worse it becomes. So for me, like not taking a plane for whatever it was, like five or 10 years made that phobia worse. Um, and it, and it's, it's also things like, even if you force yourself to do it and you feel like you've kind of just survived that one experience, that makes it worse as well. You really do need to kind of change your, your thinking and your, your kind of attitude to somewhat in some way, uh, about it, I think. Funnily enough, talking about Pike, I was interviewing, um, for an article that I'm writing, a woman recently, uh, who talked about how she had a phobia of flying. And the thing that got her over that phobia was that she really wanted to go to the, big Star Trek convention in Las Vegas, particularly because she wanted to go and meet Jane Brooke because, um, and th this, this was to do with another experience that she'd had. She suffered some PTSD and the character of Cornwall in Discovery had really helped her through that. And she talked to Jane Brooke about this online and so on. And she really wanted to go and see her at the convention, but she'd never been on a plane before in her life. She was absolutely terrified of it. Um, and she sort of talked to me a little bit about you know, how she managed to get through that experience and how she managed to cope with that fear. And I don't think she had an approach the way I did with like my pills and my Paul McKenna and this and that and all these kind of things in my, in my sort of repertoire. For her, it was much more about just like, there's a very good reason that I want to do this. I'm very, it was very sort of goal oriented, but she also said she'd written down on a, on a folder that she had in her lap. Um, Cornwall's, I think Cornwall's final line in that final episode of Discovery before she kind of sacrificed herself, which was, uh, funnily enough, to Pike. You know, you were talking about Pike's fears and Pike's anxieties, which was whatever your path may be, you can handle it, which is exactly the sort of thing that it's, you know, it's kind of like a sort of mantra that you might say to someone to tell themselves. And I just thought that was interesting. She was saying for her, that was got what got her through that 10 hour flight, basically, was this this one line from this character that had inspired her with kind of strength and bravery and courage and all those kind of qualities, um, that was enough to kind of see her through that. 
in a way. And so I, so I suppose there's an example of Star Trek itself giving people courage in a way to face their fears and to, to, to do the scary thing. Um, and she said, and she got to the convention and she, you know, got to meet up with Jane Brooke and that was a wonderful experience. And also she got to meet up with Anson Mount and she talked to him about it a bit. Uh, and he made that connection as well with Pike about, you know, characters facing their fears and kind of growing from that experience, um, as a result. Yeah. Um, there are, there are phobias that I have had that I don't have anymore simply because I, I don't know if I just outgrew it or what happened there. And I'm actually grateful for that because like I used to have nightmares about fire all the time, like almost every single night. And when I was a child, I had no idea why. When I was a teenager, my grandmother told me, Oh, you watched an apartment building burn down when you were about a year old. <laughs> Like, right. oh, there you go. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, why did you let me stay around and watch that? She's like, I was busy trying to get everyone out of the apartment building. I handed you off to a neighbor. And uh, yeah, so so I understood that. But then also my father was in an accident when I was about five where he was terribly burned over a lot of his body and was not expected to survive. And so I had a lot of dreams about being burned or being in fire until I was about 16 or 17. And then for some reason it just stopped. And I don't know if it's because I just was okay and it wasn't a phobia anymore. I still have a healthy fear of fire, but it's not like if somebody lights a candle, I'm going to go run in the other side of the house. So I, I got over that. However, when we were at Universal Studios, Dave and I, uh, we, there, they had a, an attraction that was basically about the movie Backdraft, which is about fire and firefighters. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, I've been to that one. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the final area where you're in the replica yeah. of the factory and they have that fire start. I had a difficult time with that. And I think it was because more of my claustrophobia than the fire. Uh, okay. Also, there was a cap in one of the floors nearby where I was standing that when it fired, it drove itself into my leg. <laughs> so, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I was just like, oh, and actually that thing right there brought me out of the fear. I'm just like, oh, a cap just went off into my leg. Well, I'll, let's see if they have a Band-Aid when we get out of here. So, and and they were very kind. See, that's the kind of thing that for me would make me feel much worse because it would suggest that there are poor kind of health and safety regulations in place. I mean, that's the kind of thing like on a plane, uh, something quite minor, you know, I don't know, like a light, like a reading light stops working. That's mm. the sort of thing that would make me think, okay, someone's not maintaining this plane properly. <laughs> you, you know, they <laughs> well, if they can't deal with the light bulbs, who knows if they, you know, check the engines or whatever. But it's interesting, like for you, that kind of spoiled the illusion almost. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember that that backdraft experience. I mean, it stayed with me. I've never had a phobia of fires. So I, I quite like fire generally. I find it quite exciting, but um I'm not a pyromaniac, <laughs> in a kind of normal way. but I, I found that definitely that backdraft experience much more entertaining really than watching the film backdraft, which left me slightly underwhelmed. Um, Never saw the film. It. But it's, it's, it's funny enough, um, talking about fire, isn't there an episode of Next Gen where Geordie has a phobia of fires? He talks about having been in a fire or something. And I, I should have pulled this up before this episode unless i'm imagining this i'm sure he has a whole speech about having having some scary experience of a fire when he's a child um now obviously maybe maybe this is my faulty memory and this is not true but but i think this is the case in which case you would think even more so that he would be kind of sympathetic to reg barkley and his and his fear of the transporter because you know everyone who's, who's had one of these bad experiences uh that, that there's going to be an element of um You'd think it would make you more sympathetic towards others. But having said that, I do think phobias can be quite personal and they can be quite sort of idiosyncratic. Um, recently, I don't know if you saw, there was a thing in the news about um, the new iPhone, the iPhone 11, uh, and it has these three cameras, whereas they, like mm. my iPhone, I think, has two, you, you know, going back, they had one. And it has this cluster of cameras. And this cluster of cameras apparently has triggered the phobia of a certain group of people who are fearful of uh, small holes in proximity to each other. And, and I, I saw this, this wow. thing coming out and, and lots of people were, were saying about this and other people were saying, this is ridiculous, don't be stupid, you, you, you know, you can't be scared of that. I have to say, I was once, uh, I have a friend who 
obviously has this phobia because I was once rehearsing a play and I came along to the rehearsal. It was in the, in the evening. I hadn't had much to eat. So I, I brought like some tea bags with me and I brought some crumpets. Um, I don't know if you call them something different. Crump- crumpets are like uh, little things you put in the toaster and they have lots of little holes in them and you might put jam on them or you might put butter on them or whatever. And I literally, I, I, I got this crumpets out of the bag and I said, oh, I picked these up on the way. Would you like me to, would you like one? And she literally jumped about a metre back from me and said, put that away. I can't, I can't be in the room with that. That's how strong her reaction was, <laughs> was literally because these this food stuff has these little holes in it. Uh, it triggered some terribly intense reaction and i've no idea I, I don't think anyone has a traumatic childhood experience relating to crumpets all i can think in that instance is there's something about that kind of slightly crumbly look with all those holes that on some unconscious level maybe makes us think of decay and death and things mm-hmm. rotting or so there's, there's something about it that it's like it's not whole and it's almost like it's kind of caving in on itself i don't know so so a phobia like that, I mean, my reaction was, wow, that seems a bit extreme and a bit strange. But the fact is, uh, she was genuinely scared to be in the room with those crumpets. And lots of people apparently are genuinely scared to be in the room with these iPhones that have, you know, three cameras close together on them. And for Apple, that obviously is a potential problem. Well, um, we don't have crumpets here at all. Okay. Not not even the the closest thing I can think of that might have little holes in it is a pop tart, but that's definitely not a crumpet. Uh, I will tell you that you are correct about Jordy having a fire experience. At the age of five, he was briefly caught in a fire, and due to his blindness, he was unable to escape it, but was rescued by his father. And that was uh, right after that was when he got his first visor. Ah, right. Okay. So, yeah, he's he's been in a fire. You were not imagining it. See, Memory Alpha led us down there because I went to the Memory Alpha page on phobias in preparation for this, trying to think, you know, have I forgotten anything? And I had completely forgotten about Neelix in the episode night. So mm. I sort of added that to my list. But I'm pretty sure, you know, someone needs to go and update that and work out whatever pyrophobia or whatever it is that uh, yeah. that Geordie has in that instance. I don't know if he considers it a phobia. And so therefore, I don't know that Memory Alpha considers it a phobia because it is in his bio, but it's not really shown as a phobia phobia so much as a traumatic es- experience and i don't think that it's i mean he might be afraid of being caught in a fire but i don't know if that necessarily has to do with the fact that it's fire i would think he would be very dismayed to be caught in anything without being able to see so maybe they just didn't c- categorize it as a phobia well, that's true. And certainly that's something that we see that happens to Geordie from time to time is his visor gets knocked off or something. And he is, you know, very vulnerable in that in that situation. I mean, it's interesting. Obviously, you can have a traumatic experience and it not create a phobia. I mean, yes. lots of people are scared of dogs. I got bit by a dog when I was quite little uh, and I've never been at all scared of dogs. I love dogs. And I don't know why that is, because I think a lot of kids in that situation, that that's exactly the experience that you would expect would trigger a phobia of dogs. And yet for some reason... Uh, it never did. But, but I guess the interesting thing is, so, so when is, when does something go from a fear or when does something go from a, a traumatic experience to being a phobia? And what's the kind of, I mean, f- to my mind, the thing about a phobia is that there is an element of, um, you're slightly in its power, if you know what I mean. You can feel apprehensive about something. You can feel anxious about something. Um, I mean, I would say, say with heights, I don't know that I have a phobia of heights. I'm slightly apprehensive, more so than I used to be. I didn't. I used to be completely laid back about heights. These days, I'm more concerned about being near the edge of something, and I would be a bit cautious <laughs> and hesitant about it. But I'm not sure I'd call it a phobia. It doesn't. It wouldn't put me off doing something. It doesn't. It doesn't make me not want to go up tall buildings or. Do, do you know what I mean? It doesn't really affect anything. It doesn't affect my decisions or my judgment or anything like that. It's more just a kind of awareness of, of danger in that situation. Um, w- one of the things that interested me about that episode, the Thor, is there's a lot of talk about the fact that it's literally a hostage uh, negotiation episode. You, you know, the clown has hostages and they're negotiating for the hostages. And this idea of not just experiencing fear, but being taken hostage by fear. And what does that mean? And I suppose that's maybe the closest to, to what a phobia can be like, that you're actually unable to 
function you're unable to kind of push through it you're unable to kind of summon that courage that you need so if you think of like neelix cowering in the dark with his nihilophobia or even garrick who who does kind of push through it in the end but there are certain moments where he basically uh you know effectively has a a kind of panic attack i I mean actually again i think quite well realized uh in that ds9 episode after image um quite well shot uh, sequence where Garrick is having this kind of panic attack. The, the audio outside is kind of blurred out. So Odo's there talking, but you can't really make out what he's saying. The, the kind of visually, the, the image is kind of, uh, affected. And so, you, you know, it conjures quite well what that experience is like, I think. And it is absolutely that idea of not being able to kind of, um, maintain any kind of ordinary, control over your body i suppose because that's what a panic attack is you know you literally you feel you can't breathe you feel you're going to die you feel something terrible is going to happen you can't kind of um it's not the same as just being scared oh there, there's someone over there and that made that made me jump or this thing is making me feel anxious or there's a big dog coming towards me it's it's more than that i suppose we see it in some ways with data in generations um when he's experimenting with that emotion chip mm. and geordie's being taken away and he's just cowering in terror and it's quite that is quite surprising because that is one of our hero characters. Um, but of course there has to be an explanation for it. It's because of the emotion chip. By the time he's kind of integrated the emotion chip, you know, in first contact, he has that line, uh, feeling a bit apprehensive or whatever. Uh, and then he turns the emotion chip off, but it's more, it, 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 even so he would, that, that seemed like a more like a reaction. He was able to, he was dealing with it. He was processing it. He was thinking, yeah, I'm kind of a bit scared now, but. I'm still going, I'll do my job, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas in Generations, he's like literally on the floor, totally um, overwhelmed by it. And I guess that's what a phobia can feel like when you get to that situation where you just feel, I don't know how to cope. I don't I don't know what to do. And with Garak, you know, you see him banging on that airlock, trying to, you know, blow himself out into space, basically. And you do get people on planes who their, their phobia of planes gets so bad that they try to open the doors in the, you know, basically potentially... This is one thing that reassured me. It is apparently impossible to crash a plane by opening a door <laughs> mid-flight because they won't open because of the pressure. Yep. Uh, but, you know, effectively, if they were able to open the door, they would bring about the very thing that they're terrified of because they would die either by going out the door themselves or crashing the plane. Um, and yet the phobia has so overtaken them and their sense of rationality and kind of reason uh, that they're just on some very basic level thing. Like, I'm trapped. I have to get out. I have to do something to get out. And they're actually making the situation much worse. They're, they're totally, they're, their mind is not really in control at that point. Yeah, I agree because I believe I, I, it's not a textbook definition, but I believe that the definition of a phobia is an irrational fear. So I, I would like to think that that's actually a bit of a, a misconception. It's not an irrational fear so much as that your reaction to that fear is re- irrational. The fear itself is, is rational. We all have fear, but the reaction to it is the irrational part. And uh, I would like to amend that uh, Picard did tell Data to turn off his emotion chip, and that's when he did that's it. That's true. He was, still, <laughs> he was still willing to experience it, and Picard's like, as much as I'm enjoying your emotional development, I think perhaps you ought to turn that off. So, yeah. That's because he remembers what happened in the last movie. You yeah. know, the last thing he wants is some ball come and attack them, and, and Data flips out like he did in Generations. <laughs> <laughs> and it's no use to them. No. Yeah. And and my fear, uh, my claustrophobia is definitely irrational because I have had panic attacks. I don't have them very often because I'm not very often in situations where my claustrophobia is triggered. But a couple of years ago when we were... Okay, we have our own nerd convention here in Utah called Fan X. It used to be called Salt Lake Comic Con, but San Diego Comic Con are jerks. Anyway, so, uh, we, we basically, it's in downtown Salt Lake City. There are not a lot of places near the convention center to park unless you want to pay like $15 a day, which is ridiculous. So we would park in this area, which was right next to the light rail system that they have in downtown Salt Lake. Please put that in other cities. We could all use one of those. Thank you. And uh, we would just hop on that light rail and it would drop us off like right on that same block that we needed to go to. But there was one night after the convention had ended that we were waiting for that train and they let too many people get on. 
And I was literally crushed by people around me, as in they were pressing me into this one bar that is supposed to be for holding on to to get out one of the doors. And it was like digging into my back. And then every time the the, the light rail slowed or or took off from a stop, those people would hit me even further. And I thought I was going to die. I literally thought I am not going to survive this and they're going to have to take my body off of this train and Dave is not going to know what to do because I'm the one who pays all the bills. These are all the thoughts going through my mind during that very short trip back to our parking lot. And even talking about it right now, I'm getting upset. I'm really getting upset right now even talking about it. Sorry. Um, and when we got finally got off, uh, I just started walking as fast as I could. To, to just get to the parking lot and get to a place where I could deal with it. And my husband is trying to help. And I'm like, just shut up, just shut up, just shut up. And I couldn't, I just couldn't deal with anything. And we finally got to the car and I just sat in the car and I cried for like 10 minutes before we could even get on the road to go home. And after that, I was able to just return to being a regular, somewhat well-adjusted person and actually discuss it in a calm manner. But during that time, I was not in any way rational at all. And just the memory of it obviously produces a very emotional and somewhat irrational response. But it is that sense of not being in control of your own yeah. emotions in a way, isn't it? And it's all very well saying to someone, you can talk, you know, you, you feel in that situation, you can talk yourself around, you can, you know, you can kind of counter those thoughts. No, but you can't. In a way, you can't. Moment. And that's why I, I think the only way to deal, well, I, I don't want to say the only way to deal with a phobia or whatever, but like for me, certainly with the fear of flying or whatever, uh, the only way what I find helpful is, you know, having read a whole book, which gives me lots of thoughts, I can kind of remind myself of certain things. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways, if you're prepared beforehand with what you're going to go through. And that's the other thing, actually, that the Paul McKenna stuff prepares you for is he sort of talks you through the flights from taking off to leveling out. He always has this bit, which I'm sure is deliberate, where he says there's a crash as the toastess's trolley falls over. So he uses the word crash and then makes it sound like it's, <laughs> it's nothing, <laughs> nothing serious. Uh, it's, all, it's all mind games, basically. Yep. Uh, you know, fool, fooling your unconscious in various ways. But it is very much like it's partly like going through it all in your head beforehand. And then it's partly sort of working out what are you going to say to yourself when you hear a loud noise? Uh oh, it's okay, it was just, yeah, whatever, like the trolley falling over or whatever. You know, when you, there's a bit of turbulence, well, that's normal, that, that's what happens on a plane. You know, so it's sort of preparing you for all these things and thinking ahead of time and kind of prepping yourself for that difficult um, experience. But when something like you're describing happens unexpectedly and you weren't really prepared for it at all, that can be very hard because it's once you're in that mode, that sort of fight or flight mode, it's very hard to rationally think yourself out of it because i mean i remember talking to someone once uh, talking to a psychologist and she said basically um when you go into that kind of fight or flight mode there's a part of your brain that effectively disconnects uh because you go into this very much more sort of primal survival mode and you're actually it's not possible really to make uh rational decisions because that part of your brain is not is effectively not active in that moment um and i suppose that's why the only way to manage it is by kind of um preparing yourself and reminding yourself okay if this happens this is what i do and and breathing things like that and maybe you know who knows barclays plexing um i mean i i don't know if we see much more of that going forward but you, you know that's something that um you know, maybe just as a distraction, maybe it's like taking the deep breaths, maybe it's whatever you can do. I mean, sometimes all you can do is physically try to change the conditions of your body, taking, you know, three deep breaths or whatever it is. And that, to some degree, will calm your mind down and maybe give you access to, to find the solution that you need. But it's not, certainly not always easy. Um, I mean, maybe Janeway's right, maybe those you know, Starfleet captains, they're just very well trained for those situations. Maybe they're very well prepared uh, for these kind of emergency kind of crises to know what to do. I mean, look at Troy landing the, the saucer section of the Enterprise D mm -hmm. in a pinch. You, you know, she seemed to, we, we'd never seen her flying the ship before. She seemed to know exactly what to do. She didn't, you know, bat an eyelid, really. Um, maybe that is part of it. Maybe it's not just that they're these kind of uh, superheroes. Maybe it's that they're 
they're super well prepped and well trained and that's what Starfleet Academy gets you one way or another and you know poor old Nog he only did one year and no wonder he he struggled with all that you know when he had a truly horrific experience that is true um and uh a shout out to all those people who make jokes about uh, having a woman driver and, of course, she crashes the ship. You can all bite me, okay? <laughs> people are alive because of Deanna Troy, all right? So you can just back that train up. Deanna Troy is the Captain Sully of the 24th century. Yes! Actually. Yes! <laughs> Thank you! Yes, definitely. No, I agree. I think she did a very good job. And also, if you think about Im- imagine being Councillor Troy in a moment when the ship is crashing, not only does she have to concentrate on landing the saucer section, she's got the emotions of a thousand people whose ship is about to crash going on in her head. I mean, it'd be bad enough, you know, and not that I obviously expect to ever be in a plane crash but like that must be a very terrifying experience for everyone going through it but imagine if you're the empath on board who's Mm -hmm. who's experiencing that a thousand times over because everyone is thinking the same thing um it's a wonder she was able to see straight in that situation you know let alone land the saucer section pretty much perfectly yeah i i think that she was super focused and she basically, I, I wouldn't say that she blocked it out, but she didn't react. And I think that that has a lot to do not only with training as an empath, training as a counselor, but also training as a commander. I think all of those three things allowed her in conjunction with each other to do what she was able to do and to not, you know, get lost in everybody else's feelings at that time. So she's even more of a bad well, I can't say that word. She's even more of a diva than you guys <laughs> give her credit for. She's the bomb, Deanna Troy. Absolutely. Well, um, thinking about uh, almost kind of at the other extreme in some ways, I mean, although I've said that um, our hero characters in Star Trek typically don't have these kind of uh, phobias or these these kind of fear responses, there is one character, of course, who certainly for most of the first two seasons does, I suppose. And that's Saru. And I don't know that we could say that Saru exactly has a phobia, Mm. but he is certainly someone whose entire life is constrained by fear. And it doesn't necessarily stop him from doing what has to be done. But it is something that he, you know, as he describes it, it never leaves him. And I suppose, you know, for anyone who's who's had a phobia, you know, so for example, I I have a phobia of flying. Okay, I can... um, manage uh, even a fairly long flight if needs be but there is still an enormous sense of relief when the plane touches down i feel like okay i can let go do you know what i mean because Mm -hmm. all of that time that i was in that experience of being on the plane i might be watching a film i might be doing you know reading a book i might i might be trying to distract myself whatever well i'm not gonna it's not that i'm gonna be in a heap on the floor i can have a conversation with someone and so on but there is like a low despite all this stuff that i've done to be able to get that far there's still a kind of a level of anxiety simmering along um, and kind of where, like wariness uh, that will not stop until that experience is completely over. And I know, okay, we, we landed and I can forget about that until, you know, a week's time where I have to do it again in the other direction or whatever. Now, Saru is living in that kind of experience all the time, effectively, you know, his life is, you know, up until the, um, what's it that he goes through in season two. Um, it, is living in that state of kind of low level, high level, you know, whatever it is, but of a state of kind of constant fear going on all the time in the background. And that I think is quite an interesting um, aspect of that character. I mean, people tend to talk about Saru in terms of anxiety rather than phobias. And I I can certainly understand that. And I think, you know, uh, having suffered with anxiety as well in the past, I I can, I can see those parallels very much, but I think that idea of just kind of, um, not being able to sort of let go of, of those kind of emotions, you know, even while you're trying to just sort of live your life. Uh, that is a very interesting aspect of that character and particularly a character who is a kind of Starfleet hero. And I think for a lot of people to start off with, uh, myself included to some extent, found that hard to understand about this character. You're kind of thinking, well, how how is this guy in Starfleet if he's scared of everything all the time? But the fact is he's doing it anyway. You, you, you know, I mean, you could say, why, <laughs> you know, why are you, taking a plane if you're if you're scared of taking planes or whatever he's decide he is feeling the fear and doing it anyway 
Yeah, he is. And well, the thing is, uh, and the, the process that he went through is called Vaharai, which, uh, they were, the Kelpians were led to assume that that meant their death. Uh, mm. no, it just meant they were on the verge of evolving and that was the time they would get culled. So they just naturally, well, they were taught to associate that as death. Mm. The thing with Saru is he has no choice over the fear. It is a biological part of him that he can't make go away. It's not like we can keep exposing ourselves to the things that make us afraid. Everything makes him afraid because it is built into his DNA at that point until he evolves. And when he evolves, he is still himself and yet he is so much more confident and self-possessed and understands so much more about himself. But to see the things that he has achieved simply because he believed that he could be more than what he had been raised to believe, that is – that could, could any of us do that well in his circumstances? Could any of us overcome that need to run and hide? Every time that fear was triggered, which was quite often, granted, there are different levels of fear, but he's always got this low level of fear. Always. Always. Could we live with that? I think we'd go insane. And yet, mm-hmm. he just he just keeps going. He just keeps believing that he can do more, and he proves to himself that he can do more and is rather a bit of an overachiever. How many languages does he know? 92, I think? As in, doesn't need a universal translator, actually knows the language and is fluent in. That's crazy. But yeah, Saru is one of my favorite characters of all time, simply because he is that person that is afraid of everything and does not ever let it stop him. Ever. That's an interesting point. You're right. I mean, absolutely. He, We're aware of it. And he's obviously very aware of it, but it doesn't really... It doesn't cause him to make bad decisions or nope. to kind of back off from things really at all. Um, I mean, compared to someone like actually say Barclay, I mean, Barclay, as well as having transportive phobia, I think he basically has social phobia. Oh, he's, uh, he's, you know, we see definitely. that he retreats into fancy. He retreats into the, into the holotech. He does avoid, uh, when there are things that he's scared of, he, he very much avoids them. And, and usually there's a journey of like in the course of that episode, him learning to, uh, to not avoid that thing anymore and to kind of, get over that problem in some ways but you're right Saru is someone who uh lives with it constantly but I mean other than maybe in that first episode there is a sense that he's offering the more cautious like compared to Michael Burnham he's offering the more cautious options and there's there's sometimes a sense that like maybe that's coming from him you know maybe someone who's more anxious is more likely to be more risk averse uh, that it's almost the sort of anti Captain Kirk. You know, Captain Kirk doesn't fear anything. He doesn't believe he can die. He doesn't believe in the no win scenario. He mm-hmm. kind of, um, he, he's confident that everything will always work out brilliantly and therefore he can risk everything every time. Um, and, and maybe, you, you know, someone in Saru's situation is likely to be a little bit more cautious in some way. But you're right. He absolutely doesn't ever let it limit him Mm -hmm. really um and and certainly towards the end of season one where we see saru in uh command of discovery we find maybe to our surprise that he's a very effective commander and we didn't see that coming early on in that season um i suppose that's why to my mind there's something slightly almost disappointing about that whole vaharai storyline because i sort of feel like Does it actually make him less of a kind of inspiring character in a way? I mean, one way of looking at it is like he's he's got through his fear. He's moved beyond it. He's grown as a person and now he's okay, uh, and he doesn't have that baggage anymore. The other way is to say that they've actually taken away something that was quite empowering and inspiring about that character by giving him the sort of the quick fix. Do you know what I mean? Like he doesn't have that thing to struggle against anymore. Disagree, because now he has a new thing to struggle against. Rage. The rage, the rage of what the Bahara, uh, the, the, no, I'm Uh-oh. confusing my, I'm, co- I'm combining words again. Sorry, folks. This is, this is how storm fart happened. Anyway, uh, he's got this, and that's the thing about the Kelpians is that they almost wiped out the Baul just from rage. And 
the Ba'ul never gave them the chance to evolve beyond that, to learn how to come to terms with that, because when you remove fear from them, apparently they become very angry <laughs> about being lied to for thousands of years. Thousands and thousands of years, it seems. So there, and there were a lot of people because, you know, I know I do a discovery podcast. There were a lot of people who were thinking that Saru was going to go off the rails. And I said, absolutely not. He is better than that. He knows what it's like to live with fear. And now he has to learn what it's like to live with that rage and choose to react to it differently. He couldn't choose how to react to his fear. His fear was part of his biology. The rage isn't. The rage is not part of his biology. And it is something that he can choose how to react to that and how to overcome that and possibly even sometimes how to use that when the circumstances may warrant it. Well, that is an interesting way of looking at it. And I think you're right. That will be an interesting part of his character going forward. And obviously, a lot of people do, you know, as a result of past experiences and so on, have to carry a lot of rage with them and learn how to sort of integrate that. Um, and and maybe that will be part of Saru's challenge going forward. I was when you were saying that, I couldn't help thinking, you know, who knows, maybe in Picard, we're going to have um, Lieutenant Barclay uh, coming back 20 years on. Uh, now instead of phobias he'll be consumed with rage wouldn't that be an interesting <laughs> actually that dynamic? Would. like when Kess came back to Voyager and she was just like psychically blasting corridors to pieces you know yeah. well and the thing about Barclay that I think is highly misunderstood by a lot of people is that Barclay is an introvert the thing about introverts versus extroverts is that many extroverted traits are lauded and desired, and many introverted traits are given a very negative connotation. Oh, your daughter's too shy. Oh, your daughter's too emotional. Or she's too this or too that. That's the same thing that is being done to Barclay. Whereas the difference between introverts and extroverts is not that one's bad and one is good. And we need to stop looking at people that way. Stop valuing only extroverted traits. Introverts are extremely introspective people. They have insights that other people do not see or experience. They often are very sensitive and can feel other people's feelings. Sometimes they can judge people immediately within meeting them as to whether they're a good or bad person. There are a lot of things about introverts that are very good qualities, and yet all of those are just like, oh, well, they're socially anxious and all of those things. And I get so tired. I am an introvert. I get so tired of being labeled that way. So please, guys, stop labeling Barclay's traits as negative. They are not. They are traits of an introvert. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting point. And I wonder whether is that partly because, I mean, well, I was going to say most most of Starfleet's, like Star Trek's main characters are extroverts. But I don't know if that's true, because I don't know whether someone like Geordie actually is a bit of an introvert, probably, mm -hmm. isn't he? I mean, you, you know, actually a fair number of them maybe are one way or another, um, because you do get these characters who are very specialised and very skilled in their particular area. Um, but that, that, that certainly that's an interesting way of looking at it. I think the thing with Barclay is that really Barclay ends up as a character having to kind of absorb quite a lot of different problems simply mm. because that's where they that's that's the way that they use that character and every time they do a new episode there's some new problem that he has and therefore he ends up seeming like this guy who's just like a, a sort of catalog of um <laughs> of different issues in a way. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And even by the time you get to Voyager and he's still kind of catching up with Deanna Troy, you get the sense that he's like her I mean, if she was billing for her hours, he'd be her, you know, most desirable patient, wouldn't he? Because he's yeah. kind of never going to be out of therapy one way or another. But I mean, partly that is an example of just a slightly sort of formulaic way of, of using that character and kind of telling, kind of telling the same story over and over again to a certain extent with Barclay. Um, yeah. but you know, I, I do think the, the realm of fear in particular, is quite an effective episode. I think it's a good Barclay episode. I think his transporter phobia makes a lot of sense. It fit, it does fit with what we've seen of his character. Uh, and we do see him 
you know, summoning up that kind of inner courage, not right at the beginning, but as the episode goes on and getting to the point where he is able to kind of save the day and, and solve the problem. And, you know, and that's the good thing about Barclay, I suppose. And we do see this over and over again is as much as he's not the kind of classical Star Trek hero in the way that the, you know, the kind of fearless, uh, James Kirk or, or William Riker or whatever. Ultimately, there is a place for him on that ship. And there is always a situation where he's the one who comes up with a solution, you know, maybe to our surprise, maybe to their surprise. But um, and one of the things that I think is quite nice in that episode is they do show him a fair amount of respect. I mean, everyone thinks Barclay is stressed and exhausted and seeing things. But when he comes into the conference room and he says, you know, I, I understand why you think that, but I promise you, I, I'm right. You know, I, I'm certain about this. I know that there's something there. Uh, Picard basically says, OK, fine. We'll take, you know, take the transporter apart. We're, you know, we, we basically put the hours in to find the answer to this problem. We're going to believe what you're saying. Um, and I think that is quite, it's not really so much the phobia aspect of it, but just the fact that Barclay has this phobia, the fact that Barclay has all these neuroses and so on. Um, as much as you might say that Star Trek slightly stigmatizes them in the way that it's presented, A, you've got this writer, Brandon Braga, who is writing from his own experiences. I mean, I saw an interview with him. He, he said in relation to this episode, people around here say, I am Barclay. That's where the idea came from. Uh, and he, he said he was tapping into his own deeper neuroses uh, to write Barclay. Now, it's weird because we think of Brandon Braga as this very kind of cocky, confident young guy, but he was obviously able to sort of draw on that side of himself. And actually, the other characters... Um, much even compared to say Hollow Pursuits where I think there is quite a lot of Barclay bashing going on in Realm of Fear I feel there is a, a fair amount of respect for Barclay I mean sometimes his behaviour seems a bit slightly ridiculous or, mm. or slightly exasperating mm. but on a more basic level they do respect what he's saying and they do want to listen to him and to try to kind of um, engage with him Yes, I agree. I still don't like overall the way that he was treated in Next Gen. I was very frustrated with it because, again, I identified with a lot of Barclay's qualities. And as a child, uh, I didn't deal well with reality and I would retreat into fantasy when I could. And sometimes I still do that, but I don't do that in a antisocial way per se. Basically, um, I take out all of my frustrations and everything on video games. So I play a lot of video games. That's where I have my escape. But I know that the still the, the real world is still out there and I don't live in the fantasy. I just use it to get back on par so that I can deal with the actual world, which is not always the easiest thing to do. It's interesting, too, that you use the word fearless. I do not think fearless exists. Everybody is afraid of something. Even sociopaths and psychopaths are afraid of something. It's just a matter of finding what that thing is. But people who seem fearless, mm, there's always something. There's one thing that they're afraid of. We may never find out what it is, and sometimes that would be... An interesting, uh, that might make an interesting Star Trek episode. Take somebody who's fearless and find out what it is they actually fear. Hmm. Somebody get on that one too. Somebody out there, writer, <laughs> get on that. Just credit me for the idea. That's all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think I suppose you do see in the episode night, you know, Captain Janeway, who claims that captains don't feel fear. There is, you know, something going on. I mean, it's not a phobia, but uh, she is obviously has a fear of letting people down. Mm -hmm. Of do you, do you know what I mean? There are things that are playing on her mind. There are worries that they have. And I think increasingly in kind of 90s Star Trek in DS9 and Voyager, I mean, you had run it though, that episode and... um is it Shadows and Symbols? I think you know, the start of, of DS9's seventh season must have been airing fairly close together. And you had basically both captains having a kind of crisis of confidence one way or another. Um, so I think there, there was a sort of move at a certain point to try and slightly, hu you know, you could say humanise uh, these characters, make them more flawed, make them less kind of heroic. We saw that with all the characters to some extent. With uh, Kirk in the movies, we saw him more flawed, m more in terms of his personality and his kind of... Um, uh, attitudes and, and these kind of things. He was less of a kind of perfect hero. With Picard, obviously, in First Contact, we see him really, you know, kind of losing it to some extent. Uh, Janeway and Cisco both similarly get to a point where they kind of effectively can't do their job anymore. Um, Archer, to some degree, you, you know, we get some of that after the whole kind of Zindi situation and so on, though it's resolved quite quickly. Um, 
So I think it's interesting. I do, I do think there's a sort of move towards kind of playing on the more fallible aspects of these characters, but it is usually something that's resolved pretty quickly, uh, and kind of every, and then they go back to being the kind of, yes, maybe not actually fearless, but seemingly fearless. That's, that's the, that's what's projected, this kind of fearless front almost, um, that we're used to. Whereas someone like Saru is quite unusual in that, it's not just one episode where that taps into his fear. It's actually there all the time, day mm-hmm. by day, week by week. Um, and that's part of what kind of defines his character or certainly defined his character to begin with. I agree. And I, I think with Saru too, that after he was able to not feel fear every single second of every single day, he actually became even more compassionate. I felt like he was a compassionate person before, but after that fear was gone, he became even more compassionate, especially to people who were going through a crisis of identity, like Culber, after being reconstituted from the mycelial network. Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen Discovery. Um, but, and just, and, and compassionate, especially towards Michael. His relationship with Michael grew leaps and bounds in season two. And there are certain situations where, you know, he knows she's upset, but she refuses to admit it. But you can just see on his face, yeah, you're going through something, but you don't want to talk about it. So I'm just going to wait. And we'll see. Because there's there's that situation. Oh, what episode is that? I believe it's episode nine. And she and she's trying to help Spock understand why the Red Angel chose him to communicate with. And she lures him into playing chess. And he has an emotional outburst and basically, you know, destroys the chess set and walks off. And the minute after he's gone, she's at being asked to report to the bridge. She doesn't have time to deal with it. So she just stuffs it all down. But as she walks on the bridge, Saru is immediately, he, you can just see from what, how he looks at her. He knows something's wrong. And he even asks her if she's all right. And she says, I'm fine. And he does not believe her at all. So his level of compassion and, and sympathy and empathy actually ratchets up even more because he's not got that fear overriding everything anymore. Well, there's something for us all to aspire to, hopefully. <laughs> no kidding. No kidding. <laughs> Let go of fear and become, and you can become Deanna Troy and, and you deal with everyone's emotions while simultaneously uh, landing the ship uh, if needs be, which means people like me have nothing to fear because obviously, you know, that ship's never going to crash. There you go. Uh, it's going to be, be landed perfectly uh, adequately. Yes. Um, well, it's been fun talking about our fears. Uh, it's been therapeutic, at least, yes, I think, um, Brandy. But um, before we go, do you want to let our listeners know where they can find you on the Trek FM network? And if they want to come and chat to you on social media, what's the best way to do that as well? Well, you can find me on Twitter at BrandyWine12. That's Brandy with an I and 12 is the number. You can find me lurking from time to time in the Babel Conference. August was a really busy month for me, so I wasn't on there much. When new episodes of Discovery are airing, you can hear and or see me on Live from the Edge, which is our live reaction podcast with Bruce Gibson. I miss those days. I miss seeing Bruce every week. <laughs> and uh, uh, we also have, my husband and I also have a podcast called The Dark Corner Podcast, where we talk about basically whatever nerdy thing we want uh, through more of a darker lens. We are... We are um, sort of gothy people. Not sort of gothy people. We are gothy people. So, uh, and there's a lot of stigma attached to that. I have a lot of stigma attached to many of the uh, facets of my life. Just stop stigmatizing stuff, guys. Uh, and you can find that at darkcornerpodcast.com. So those are the best ways to find me. Oh, keep in mind, I do swear sometimes in the dark corner. I don't have the... Um, the ability to um, always say just normal words. Sometimes you just got to swear. It, it, helps when you, enough. it helps when you hurt yourself. They proved that on Mythbusters, that swearing when you've hurt yourself actually helps you deal with the pain better than using pseudo swear words. Well, I wonder, maybe it helps with phobias as well. You know, and who knows? Maybe that's something to, something to try out there. Well, thank you, Brandy, for joining us. It's been a pleasure having you on the show again. Um, talking about spiders, snakes, 
plane crashes, falling from heights, clowns, etc. Uh, is not, fortunately, the only thing we've been doing on Trek FM this week, though. So here's a listen to what else you might have missed out on on the network. Previously on Trek.FM, The Edge, a Star Trek Discovery podcast. Wait, so what switched between your two lists? Calypso comes in. Runaway comes in second oh, of right, importance. Right. Okay. But Calypso comes in second in enhancement of the season. Okay. I see and really, even in importance, I could probably, in my head, flip Calypso and Runaway because I don't mm-hmm. need Runaway. Literary treks. I, I find that the characters don't quite look like they're actors. You're right. And I think that's because I'm, I started to see something, little flashes in both Pike's face and in number one's face. Is this a representation? And maybe this is totally me reading in way too deep, but is Pike kind of our John F. Kennedy in the sense that Jeffrey Hunter died tragically? Pike, Pike's story ended quite tragically as the first pilot. And I think we've been sort of trying to sort of what if him. Right. And I think a lot of people, what if the death and loss of Kennedy in the 1960s as well, which I think also has a lot to do with the hopeful nature of why Star Trek TOS was the way it was. Right. Earl Grey. (laughs) Imagine, imagine if aliens came to uh, STLV or something like that and said, hey, we're making first contact. It'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, wow, that's an amazing cosplay. Great cosplay. Exactly. (laughs) Oh, oh, your cosplay is terrible. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You're like. You know what? You don't look Made like anybody China. who's been in Star Trek. What are you supposed to be? And introducing our newest show, The Line, a Star Trek Picard podcast. Al- alternative Factor is better than Nemesis. Alternative Factors. I know you'll say Alternative Factor is better than a lot of things, and I'll disagree. <laughs> I, I'm going to abstain from an opinion there. <laughs> Good. I win. You guys don't fight me on that one. There you go. Oh. <laughs> Right, and abstention's as good as a, a no, okay, or yes. Um. <laughs> and that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favourite corner of the Star Trek universe, and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcasts on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they're published. And please leave us a star rating and a written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and there are many ways for you to do that. The best place to join in the larger conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners' group on Facebook. Just type Babel, B-A-B-E-L, into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. Choose to send to a show and select Primitive Culture and that will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at trek.fm and on Facebook at facebook.com slash trek.fm. If you'd like to help us keep all our shows coming to you each week, you can become a patron of the network on Patreon. Visit patreon.com slash trek.fm that's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash track fm to get all the details. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits and more available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host and distribute these shows each month. So we really appreciate any support you can give us and we hope you'll join the team. Again, you can find all our details at patreon.com slash track fm. We'd like to take a moment now to thank our associate producers on Primitive Culture, Amy Nelson, Clara Cook and Tony Black. Amy is a presenter of many other shows on the network and you can find her on Twitter at at Miss Amy Nelson. Clara and Tony were two of the former co-hosts of this show and they'll be popping back from time to time. You can find Clara on Twitter at at Clara Jean MC and Tony at at AJ Black Writer. You're blended, all right.